Hi, this is Think Tech. Uh, we're in the three to four block here on Wednesday, an exciting Wednesday. And the three to four block is, of course, catching up with Kaka'ako. We're going to talk about TOD and transportation in Kaka'ako with no less than the Director of Transportation Services of the city, Mike Formby, an old friend of Think Tech. Thank you so much for coming down, Mike. It's good to be back. <laughs> so, what is TOD anyway, so we can sort of get our signals straight? Yeah, it, it normally goes by by the acronym TOD, but it stands for Transit Oriented Development. And it's a new type of development in Hawaii where we actually build a community around planned transit, which includes the rail. There'll be two stations, three if you count the Aloha, um, the Aloha station, but there'll be two stations in Kaka'ako wh wh itself. Where will they be? Well, so one will be at Aloha Tower, right down on, on Bishop Street. And the other two, I've actually brought maps that I can show you. So the downtown station is right across from the existing HECO plant. Can you get a shot of that? Let's see if we can get a close-up of that. Keep talking. Yeah, so that's the downtown station. It's right across from the HECO plant, which is right now, I guess, uh, decommissioned. Mm -hmm. And then the second station is called the Civic Center Station, and it's on Halikawila mm -hmm. at South Street. So that's in Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. And the third station is called the Kaka'ako Station, and it's between Ward Avenue and Queen Street. Wow. Sort of catty corner. Really, there. you know, I didn't realize three of them all within a fair close distance. And I guess that's consistent with the idea that you can walk between the stations. Or putting it this way, you're never very far from a station. That's right. And and so the way we look at it is you can you can walk, you can bike, you could take a taxi, there you could do many things other than own a car and go to the stations. So if I, if I walk, I can walk down the street, and in like five or eight minutes, I'm going to be at the next station. It won't, be, it won't take me very long. Yeah, I think so, at the most, eight minutes. I okay. mean, it's really close. If I have a bike, what am I going to do with my bike? So each station is going to have bike storage, and we're pushing, the city is pushing Hart, the developer, to have secure bike storage. So we don't want people to doubt when they leave their bikes, at, as if they choose to leave their bikes at the station, that when they come back later that their bike is going to be there. So we want secure bike storage. Yeah. So what is that, on the street level? Yeah, it'll be on the street level. And secure means with one of those heavy plutonium things. No, secure means that it's actually a structure that is protected and you have a fob to get inside. It's so like a have, locker, steel locker. Right. So when we go to the electronic fare media for rail and bus, we're, we're planning on making that same electronic card also operate the secure bike storage. So if you have a bike, you'd get off, you'd tap, you'd be able to open the door, you'd put your bike inside, you'd close the door, and unless somebody has a fob or a card to get in, they can't steal the bikes, they can't take your bikes. I hope you make this expandable. Maybe you're already planning that. I, I heard a piece on NPR yesterday that really warmed the cockles of my heart about bikes in Manhattan. So there are 9,000 bikes deployed in Manhattan now, and they're all being used and people are actually riding down crowded streets because for some reason, you know the story, the more bikes you have, the safer it is to ride a bike. Yeah, that's true. And the, and the drivers are watching them and they're not running them down and biking is becoming a part of the most threatening city in the world right. in terms of transportation and so it's changing the paradigm. Yeah. That could happen here. It could happen here when you think about our weather being much better than New York's weather. It should happen here year round. Yeah, yeah. So if there aren't enough uh, storage lockers at, at first, you would have the opportunity to put more in. I mean, you know, God willing, there'd be more bikes. Right, know? that's right. So we do want to expand as necessary. Our plan right now is to put the first secure bike storage in at the Fosse Municipal Building sometime this year, sometime perhaps fourth quarter of this year. And that'll be a demonstration or a pilot project to show people how they work. And we think the biking community will will gravitate to it and will say, hey, it's not so risky to bring my bike in to work anymore, and, and they'll park their bike in there, and then more people will do it. And then you know we're putting in the King Street cycle track, which goes through Kaka'ako. What is, what is that? So a cycle track Ooh, is, a is also, and if you open that up, you, you'll see on the back, open or that's you, right there. You saw it here on ThinkTech. This is hot stuff. So that the King Street cycle track is a protected bike lane. Yeah. That's going to go from downtown Urban Core, yeah. Alapai Street, all the way to the university area. And that's really to provide cyclists between the university and downtown or those that live east of downtown the ability to have a protected environment on the street in which to bike. And New York does that very well. So this is, tell me about the protected environment. I, you can't tell from the picture. So I'm on my bike. 
right. and I'm riding on, say, King Street, which is a good wide street, mm -hmm. uh, how am I protected from the traffic from somebody who may you know, not be completely attentive you know, riding down King Street? Yeah, so on the Malka side of the street, we take what were parked cars and we move them out one lane. So you're going to lose one lane of travel. We move them out and those parked cars become the barrier between the bikers and great, the curb. Great idea. Yeah. And then you put up little plastic bollards and you put up an asphalt concrete curb on the ground just high enough that people would know, people that are parking would know that you're not supposed to go across that. And that environment on the other side is reserved for bikers. Is it two ways or one way? So it's going to start out one way because that in and of itself is a paradigm shift. Yeah. And then once people see us installing the traffic lights for the bike, then we'll educate the public about the fact that it's going to become a two-way cycle track, and that means when you're making movements across King Street, you need to look to the left and the right. Yes. Right now, everybody looks to people. the right because the traffic's coming that way. They have to start looking to the left. So we want to take more time to educate. So when you, when you assuming you get to that phase two, uh, are you, you going to have something in the middle between the two directions on the bike lanes? Yeah, so it'll be marked, and, and this is how they do it on the main lane. It's basically a, uh, a double-wide bike lane, and it has striping down the middle just like a road would, and it has signals that, that tell you you're going the right direction or you're going the wrong direction. And then it also has, in any conflict zone, it has green paint on the pavement. So motorists and bikers both know when you enter the green paint, you're in an area where you could come into conflict with somebody else. I saw photographs of this kind of thing in, I, I want to say, Copenhagen. Right. Somewhere in somewhere in Scandinavia. All those cold Navy. climates do it very well. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's, it's not as easy to ride a bike. Right. They, they know how to do it. And they ride year-round. But they, in Copenhagen is probably one of the leaders in cycle tracks and in the use of bikes. Yeah. It's amazing. Big question, Mike. When? Win for the cycle track or win yeah. for all of this? So well, <laughs> you break it down any way you want. <laughs> so the cycle track is also going to be this year, and we're going to start installing it with some of our other departments. The Department of Facility Maintenance is actually going to do the physical labor in-house, and that will start in October, and it'll be finished by December. <gasps> yeah, two and a half miles. Why do, I, why do I feel this is a scoop? This is a scoop. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show and telling us of about course. this stuff. I love this. Yeah. Can you imagine by the end of the year? That is so fabulous, you know? Yeah, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. And action means so much. Congratulations to you, the whole administration. Well, thank for you. taking this approach and doing this and learning from other places and making it work. And it's really no great inconvenience for motorists either. I hope not. Yeah. Our study showed that it wasn't. Yeah. And we're going through the public education process right now. We've done three neighborhood boards and generally been received very favorably. But I'll tell you, there are motorists out there that don't like the paradigm shift. They're not ready to share the roads with bikes. So we have to convince them. And I think once they see more bikers using it, they'll get used to it. Yeah, it's not a question of them ever riding a bike, right. because those kinds of people never ride a bike. Right. But um, maybe making them sympathetic. I had a jury trial one time, <laughs> and we did what Yasutaka Fukushima was the judge. <laughs> we had we had a, we had Wadir, of course. And so we asked the jury, you know, what they thought about cyclists, because this happened on a sidewalk, what they thought about cyclists riding on the sidewalk. And about half of them said they shouldn't ride in the sidewalk. And the other half said they shouldn't ride in the street. <laughs> and, and, and Fukushima said, you guys should settle this case. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good advice. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, I mean, we're, we're in another time now. We are. And we, we can't afford to have that kind of head in the sand routine. Yeah. No, they belong on the street, and we're actually educating the communities, the biking community, about not riding on the sidewalks because it's really meant for pedestrians. And when you start talk about the disabled and the seniors, they really don't work well in an environment where bikers and all that kind of stuff are going in sure, and out of there. Sure, And you know, that's, there was something in the paper uh, today, yesterday, about, about pedest seniors and, and the troubles they have being pedestrians and they right. get hit and killed and all that. Right. And, um, you know, the, the, the great um, strangeness about that, you know, the, the anomaly about that is that we're telling them they should walk. Right. We're telling them this is a walking city. You get out there, you live longer, you be healthier, but then they go out there and get struck. Yeah. Um, and so this is really important to respect them and to make a place for them and to make sure that all the other elements of, of, of what do you call it, uh, complete streets, mm -hmm. uh, don't mow them down. No, it's <laughs> exactly know? right. It's, uh, it's a known fact that, that the senior population in Hawaii is aging. Uh, we have a very healthy senior population. We're going to have the highest senior population over 65. Right now we have the highest over 85, but we'll have the highest over 65 in probably five years. And they're very healthy.
community and we're encouraging them to be mobile and get out. So that transition period where we turn the streets into complete streets, as you said, and we make them truly multimodal for pedestrians, bikes, transit, and vehicles, it means everybody's got to play by the rules. Yeah. And if you don't, it's a disaster. But that's part of the educational component. We get out and we teach people, you've got to play by the rules. It's a matter of being tolerant, you know, and we should know how to do that. This yeah. is the great polyglot of the world here. We should be tolerant of the other guy and his special needs. So can I shift now? We're about halfway through the time allotted. Yeah. And, I, and I wanted to ask you about uh, TOD. Exactly how does it work? How does it integrate with the, uh, you know, the rail? And how does it integrate with the other parts of the community that we're talking about in Kaka'ako and around Kaka'ako? Right. So TOD is actually... Um, it's actually being pushed because of rail. So the bus goes out to wherever the communities are, but the rail, because it's a fixed guideway, means that we need to develop the communities around the stations where people can live, work, and play. And that's really the concept. The concept is, is if we build transit-oriented developments around the rail stations, people will choose not to buy cars and drive cars, or perhaps they'll buy cars but not drive them as often because they'll use transit and it will reduce traffic congestion, it will reduce pollution, it has many, many benefits. And it's worked on the mainland, it's worked in, we went to Vancouver last year just to study their system, how they went into these areas where they had no development, they put transit in, they built transit-oriented development, and it works beautifully. What is it, I mean, as opposed to ordinary development? Yeah, it, it means you design the community around the fact that there are multi-modes of transit. So not only is there bus, and taxis and Uber and all these other things that are out there nowadays, but you have a rail station and you're encouraging people to come into that community via rail and bus, and you're encouraging people that live in that community to use rail and bus and not cars. So you tend to narrow the streets, you bring the streets down, which is a complete street principle. When you bring the width of the street down, it calms the traffic. You put off-street parking. Off-street parking encourages people to park centrally and then walk. Mm -hmm. which is a healthy thing to do, mm -hmm. to walk with their families and, and, and go see places. But hopefully people will come in, like when they go to the Blaisdell, they'll come in via rail. They'll park at the Kaka'ako station, and it's a five or ten minute walk to the Blaisdell. That's a transit-oriented development. So, And then when you say that, what you're really talking about is permitting and design, and uh, George Ada, you know, making, you know, imposing new permitting requirements, I guess a city would do it, but imposing new, you would do it, imposing new requirements on the permitting around the stations yeah. so that all those rules were met and that, and that it was oriented toward all that complete street stuff. Right. Yeah. So just, just to be fair, uh, you're right outside Kaka'ako, but in Kaka'ako it's HCDA. And so oh, we work, forgot, yeah. and we work with HCDA very closely with Tony Ching and his staff on the plans that they have with the developers, and we work with the developers as well, because the streets that go through Kaka'ako start outside Kaka'ako, they start in the city, they go through Kaka'ako, and they end outside Kaka'ako. So we work very well with them, but, and we also wanna make sure that we have a plan that is consistent all along the rails. So we don't want there to be one style of TOD, and then when you get to Kaka'ako, it's like, well, this is a different world. So we work very closely with HCDA, but it's exactly what you said, and at the end of the day, you want to develop a range of housing, a range of industry and business opportunities where people can actually live, work, and play in that community. I don't think people really understand. I think they think the TOD is something that developers love because they're going to make big money or something. That's not it at all. It's a matter of designing the streets and all these integrated resources and making the community serve transportation is what it is. Well, yeah. I, I agree with you, and I, I think you're right. Your, your first comment about people don't understand, I'll tell you, when we go out to the public meetings, I think it's about change. It, it, for, for some reason, as you grow older, you're less tolerant of change. And so we find it's generational. When you go out to the community, people with my color hair tend to be very resistant. This is not going to work. We're still going to have more traffic. It's a bad thing. But when you talk to the millennials and even younger than the millennials, they're open. They're open to it. They don't want cars. They don't want houses with two-car garages. They want to live in the community where their friends are. It's a different world. Yeah. And By so the way, we're at, I, at least you have hair. What? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, but that's true. And the millennials are a new generation, and they're, may I say, my observation of them is, is they're waiting for a new city 
You know, they're like suspending, yeah. suspended themselves, waiting for all these things, these dreams to come true. Right. And this is one of them. The transportation thing, as a matter of fact, I think is really important because they don't want to buy cars. Yeah, and we tell, we tell the communities when we go out that, yes, we're building for the people that are alive today, but for the, the truth is, because these, these buildings and this infrastructure will be around for 25, 30, 50 years, we're really building for the future. Yeah. So if we're, not, if we're not meeting the needs of the future, then we're building the wrong kind of community. So it is a change for me, for you, for our, you know, our friends. But for the young people, this is what they're asking for. They're asking for a different way of living. They are. I, I validate that. Yeah. So, um, so timetable on this, this sounds like it would be concomitant with the actual finishing of the rail stations, uh, although I suppose you could, you know, plan around them before they actually get finished. And what, we what, are, yeah. yeah. So we are planning actively with HCDA, and I think everybody knows from reading the papers that there are projects that have been permitted that are under construction, some that are beginning, like Waia, mm -hmm. Howard Hughes, Kamehameha Schools is working on the SALT project, Marshall Hung has South Street project, Stanford Cars building, there's a lot of stuff happening, but the truth is, the rail line, which will be completed in Kaka'ako in 2019, will probably be in place before the TOD development is completed because it's just going to take more time to build all those condos and, and get the businesses in there and the stores and the doctors and the dentists and all those things that make it a complete community. It, you think it'll be a work in progress? I mean, we, we haven't done this before. This is going to be new territory in some right. ways. Uh, so is it a matter of, uh, you know, uh, having a vision, but then being prepared to evolve that vision mm -hmm. into a more refined TOD as you see the traffic patterns, as you see what people actually do around the station? Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Clearly, we're looking to the mainland communities that have done very well at this, but Hawaii's different. So I don't think we can take what people have done in Vancouver and Seattle and in Boston and say it's going to work here. There are pieces of it that will work, and there are other pieces that we're going to have to adapt and be flexible and meet the needs of the local community. So we hear that a lot. That, you know, this is not New York, this is not Boston, and they're right, it's not. Uh, one, one thing, and then I've got to ask you a question that's been on my mind all week. Uh, the bikes. Right. If, if, I, if I have a storage area for my bike, that's one thing, but if I want to take my bike uh, up the stairs to the station, get the bike on the train, go to the next, um, you know, state, well, go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to be possible? You know, I mean, and footnote to that is, I mean, I think that uh, Honolulu buses are great because, you know, you can do that with your bike and a bus. And, and I hope that, I hope we overload the buses going forward. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I wonder if this is built in, too, that you can take your bike up the stairs or somehow get it up to the train and then go somewhere with it. Yeah, it is. So right now the stations have an elevator, which you could use. But that's not our preference. Our preference is that the bikers use the stairs, and the stairs are actually designed with an incline on the side that is meant for the bike tires. Very good. So you put the front tire in, you put the back tire, and you it's roll it up. up the stairs yeah. to the platform above. That's so a lot easier than carrying it up stair by stair. And it keeps the bikes out of the out of the elevators, which are really for the seniors and the disabled. Yeah. So the stairs are made to accommodate the bikes, and the trains will accept bikes. So some people may choose to take their bikes with them versus secure store them or even ride bike share. Very clever, actually. Yeah. My last question, and you referred to it, which I, you know, I just want to explore with you because you're a guy who thinks about tra transportation all day, okay. um, is the thing about Uber, and it's also something called uh, Lyft, L-Y-F-T, right. which is a, sort of a duplicate of Uber. Um, I, I've been looking at this. We had a show with Dale Evans on Monday. Oh, I know you what know, that show must have been like. Uh, sure, she's, she's down, on, right. <laughs> down on Uber. Um, she's the owner of Charlie's Taxi when taxis um, being threatened by Uber, for sure. Um, so my question to you, I mean, my, my, my reaction, and I'll tell you my reaction to see how you feel about it, is I think that things like Uber, as they are in Europe, are going to change everything around here. All of a sudden, I won't really need a car. And so the number of people that actually have to use and buy and go, you know, have a car or a $70,000 SUV shrinks dramatically. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what do you think is going to happen? What's happening now? How do you think it's going to evolve? Yeah, I think you're right. I think Uber and Lyft are, are simply new modes that maybe don't fit into the regulatory scheme that we have in place right now. And so people have the right, the existing taxi companies have the right to complain that this is unfair to them. 
And I think at some point we'll either find a way to incorporate this new mode or we'll say it doesn't fit, which some cities have done. But in any case, it's simply symptomatic of the fact that we're changing the way we commute. And so the next step is car share. Car share is working with the city right now. And some of the car share shops are going to be off street in private, private lots. Some want to be really? on street in our parking meters. Some want reserved on street place, but it's the same concept that you live here and you want to get two or three miles away and you go on your phone and you look at an app and it says there's a car two minutes away and you can go and get in that car and drive where you want to go and then drop it back off. Yeah. And, and it keeps you from having to own a car. So, and I guess I hear what you're saying is, uh, is that all of these could conceivably work. Right. It's not like you have to pick one, and, you know. And, That's right, and they're very different. So the two types of car share that we're looking at right now are, are really completely different. One views a parking space as a fungible asset. You can leave it wherever you want in the city because when you go on the app, it tells you where that car is. Another, another type of car share, they want a, an identifiable place where the community knows you can always go there and get a car. But they're all part and parcel of the same concept, which is you don't need to own a car to be able to get around. Yeah, it's another one of those things, uh, work in progress. Who knows no, exactly how people are going to react, how they're going to change their lives, how the traffic will change. But one thing seems clear. We're, we're, we're in the top of the ski hill now, and we're going somewhere. And this is going to change the way people get around. And so my final question to you is, is Kaka Aqua going to be a laboratory for this? I mean, can we, can I suggest to you that we could learn a lot about how it works because we have essentially a carta blanca that's right. in, in, in Kaka Aqua. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, and that's, I've always said to the community that what better place to build TOD than Kaka Aqua because it's a blank plate and we're starting from square one versus when you go into a community that already exists and has streets and buildings and everything's there, it's very difficult to, to turn it in to a true TOD community. But in Kaka'ako, we're gonna have the opportunity to do it right, and I'm convinced that HCDA and the city are going to do it right. I believe that. You know, last time we spoke, Mike, I asked you if you loved your job. Yeah. And you told me you loved your job. <laughs> But I have a prediction. What's that? You're going to love it more. I think so, too. I think you're right. I, ho I hope you're right, but I think you are. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. Great to have you, Darren. Thank you. Thanks. We'll do it again. Okay. <laughs> Aloha. My name is Willow Chang Elion, and I host a show called The Art of Life. We air live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And what we do is basically we focus on individuals who create a unique sense of place for Hawaii. These are movers and shakers, artists, innovators. They are also traditionalists. They're all involved in the archival process and they make this place a unique place, one that makes Hawaii a richer place to be. I hope you do join us and certainly tell your friends about the show, whether they live here or they live abroad. It's a way to give back to our community. We're keeping it Pono. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. Come and watch us on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, every Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. here on Think Tech Talks. We'll meet all the people in energy, from industry to government, all around the clock to see what's going on in our clean energy initiative. Come and watch Hawaii, the state of clean energy, 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you 
you think? I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy, we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Okay, it's every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here in the three to four block. Uh, we started out with catching up uh, in Kaka'ako with Mike Formby, the director of Transportation Services, and now we have a, a special show with uh, Pat Border, citizen diplomat, who goes everywhere, does everything, and has all these thoughtful and well-informed points that we need to know to learn about how to live in Hawaii. So today our show, uh, his show by the way, is called Getting It All Together. Uh, he's one of our hosts. Today he's a guest. And we're gonna call this show The Devolution of Scotland. And that's because we think you ought to know about Scotland. We, ought to th we think you ought to know about the devolution of Scotland. And furthermore, we think you ought to know what the word devolution means. Don't you think? I think that's probably a pretty good idea. <laughs> Devolution, since he brought up the topic, <laughs> simply means the exchange of powers from a higher level of government to with the national government down to a lower level, which would be the regional or the states. And the reason this is important is because there's a topic of vital importance to Americans, to our wallets, and that is this uh, question of Scottish independence. And if you haven't heard of it, uh, you're in a large crowd. And the reason that we're talking about it today is because uh, on September 18th, with the permission of the British government, the Scottish government will hold a referendum in which the public may vote to secede from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Now you may ask, so what's the big deal? It becomes... Well, there's a big deal. Why in the world would they do that? This is 2014. People are supposed to be coming together, not separating. Well, this idea of devolution has a lot of traction in all of the uh, British regional capitals. That would include Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, in uh, Wales, and also in Scotland. Uh, uh, these uh, portions of Great Britain want more autonomy themselves. They want more uh, local taxing power so that they can shape the way their cities are uh, put together. So who's been agitating for this change? We know that Sean Connery was making uh, some noise about it a couple of years ago. But what, what groups are, are seeking to break away from UK? Ironically, both the major political parties seem to be opposed to it. Uh, the Scottish Labour Party has come up with devolution ideas which sort of um, uh, co-opt the idea of complete independence and allow taxing powers and powers to um, develop the particularly the large cities. In fact, devolution has even become a popular topic in London, Liverpool, uh, Manchester, and some of the larger uh, British cities. In other words, the power to be able to tax and plan and control these cities so that uh, they're not getting a handout from the federal government. Traditionally, in the British Isles, it's been the um, British Parliament that passes all the money bills, and then the money's doled out by the central government. Uh, and, of course, that's not the way things work in the United States. We oh, no, no. All kinds of local taxes. <laughs> um, so uh, the idea is um, it, it's developed gradually over the decades, but this is uh, the first time that outright independence is being voted upon. What, is there any trigger here? Is there anything that actually led to this? Pretty, this is a pretty remarkable thing to happen. These... these these political units have been together for a very long time. Yeah, since 1707 to be exact, pretty long time. Yeah. And so the thought of having uh, the British Isles split up into two or maybe even three different countries is a radical idea. And it, uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is a slightly grandiose <laughs> name for a country already. <laughs> but if you split it into three countries, I guess it would be teeny weeny Britain and Scotland and and uh, let's see the map and, and British and so you can give people an idea of what's happening okay here. on the map here uh, the part which is in red up in the north is Scotland so you can see as uh, as a territory it takes up a lot of what we ordinarily call England the yellow part below that is uh, England proper and then of course over next is 
the two governments in Ireland. The yellow part of Ireland is um, Northern Ireland, which is a portion of Britain, and the Irish generally are not in favor of devolution because they get high subsidies from the British government, uh, and their only other choice, obviously, as you can see from the map, is to be a part of Ireland, and they don't think they get as good a deal being a part of Ireland. And that's very interesting because traditionally, and particularly during that period when Northern Ireland was violent, everyone thought it was a religious war. But if you go to Ireland now, you'll find the Catholics and Protestants alike will say, I'm not English, but I am British, and I want to stay with Britain. That's a very common theme. The, Scot the Scots also describe themselves as being British, but not English. And so there is that um, uh, theme to it. Uh, there are practical problems with Scotland becoming independent, even if they vote for it. Um, what do you do with <clears throat> Scottish pensioners, for instance, government employees who work for 30 years? If they become a separate country, uh, they won't be paid their pensions in British pounds. Or presumably, I guess they'd have to go with the euro. And the euro is, of course, a very troubled currency right now because everywhere from Greece to Ireland to uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Right. So, to various places like uh, other of the small countries there um, have had uh, uh, real problems with their economies because they've overspent. You know, on the economic question, Pat, a friend of mine just came back from a trip to London. And what he said was London had had this huge influx of capital and labor from all over Europe and the Middle East. And there was a, an enormous new workforce in London. And I suppose that goes beyond just metropolitan London. It must go all over, all over England. Uh, and, and capital invested. And as a result, they have a fantastic you know, prosperity going on right now. It's drawing people and money from all over the world. And everyone's doing well. It's, a, uh, it's an enormous phenomenon for them. And I wonder you know, whether it's really a good idea or how it will play in the plebiscite. Uh, when you when you take into consideration the fact that England is having this extraordinary prosperity. There are all of these pressures happening at one time because you're dealing first of all with Scotland as a government entity. You're talking about Great Britain and Tony, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Cameron is, uh, David Cameron is up in Scotland now furiously promising all sorts of um, intermediate measures to give the Scottish the power to tax themselves and to control their own governments um, below the diplomatic level mm -hmm. in the effort to uh, get the no vote out so the people vote against independence. Now this question of prosperity for the moment, this gets into the Eurozone because in other words, um, the countries that have Euros also have a government at the Euro level in Belgium and with its headquarters in Belgium and uh, this issue of the flow of uh, free labor back and forth between the countries is another pressure that operates against the Eurozone. In other words, countries like Britain, f to put it quite uh, bluntly, simply do not like it when um, uh, people from other countries come in in large numbers and take the labor away from Britain. Yes, it's a labor pool. In the United States, if somebody from Texas goes up to work in, in construction projects in Colorado, we don't think that much of it. But where you're dealing with different countries, um, there's a kind of a xenophobia where the British don't want too many Spaniards or too many Portuguese or too many Irish coming over and, and taking, they can control that. taking away their job. Well, right now, they're having trouble controlling it because part of the Eurozone works on the premise and under the law that uh, labor can freely travel between the country, the 13 countries of the Eurozone. And that's a pressure that would tend, I would think, it's a pressure that would tend to operate uh, not toward independence for Scotland. Uh, there are so many uh, Eurozone countries that spend the Euro that may not always be in the Eurozone because they're in such terrible financial condition. Um, Greece is a country that hasn't recovered from the Olympics in 2000. I think it was the year 2004 uh, when uh, Athens hosted the Olympics. Uh, they're in terrible shape from that. 
Portugal is, Ireland is, Spain is, to a degree Italy is, and if those countries are not going to remain in the Eurozone, then that would work against Scotland becoming a Eurozone member because if uh, the House of Cards is falling, they don't want to get into the Eurozone. Sure. But the, but the, but British, but the British have pressure. See, the British can pressure the Scottish people because they say, if you want to be a separate country, okay, but you're not spending pound sterling anymore. Pound sterling is for Britain and Britain only. And uh, we know that the Scottish people, particularly pensioners and retirees, do not want to find themselves spending a weaker currency. They want to be paid in British pounds. And that, keep, that would tend to keep uh, the British Union of Scotland and Britain and Northern Ireland together and so ultimately well, you assume though you assume that if Scotland oh, there's leaves, a lot of assumptions that it would go to the uh, go to the EU right but isn't it possible logically that they would leave Britain or UK and not go to the EU and be their own their own it's, place? it's entirely possible and, and just think about the complexities of that if Scotland well even if Scotland goes into the economic eurozone if it's an independent country it has to have its own diplomatic policy toward other countries recognition embassies the cost is just enormous uh, of setting up another country so those are the reasons why the Scottish people could use um, this vote as leverage to get more influence uh, there's only five million Scots there's 44 million English so this gives them a little bit more leverage than they would ever otherwise have to stay in the Union now why does this impact the United States well because NATO operates in all these countries and of course Britain is a NATO country and all of the nuclear submarines in the entire NATO fleet are, uh, are headquartered in Scotland where they have all these sub bases and if Scotland secedes from that union what happens to those sub bases so both sides have a considerable amount of leverage and the upshot one would hope would be that <coughs> the Scottish people would have more influence in their own future including taxation powers but would remain a part of the United Kingdom and that's probably what will happen but it's unknown uh, even after the September 18th vote that's just another way of saying you should invite me back after the September 18th vote yes. so we can see what happens I'm saying that now I'm going on record but this all sounds like the mouse that roared excuse the expression because they're you know they're not gonna leave and for example I can see the US putting pressure on the UK and saying, look, we don't want to move our submarines. You know, just do whatever it takes to, you know, to satisfy them. And I can see them playing the game by saying, well, you know, we might leave, uh, but, you know, there are things you could do to make us happy and we won't leave. So as you said, it's a leverage thing. It's a negotiation thing. At the end of the day, the probabilities, and I'll ask you what you think the probabilities are. Uh, yeah. The probabilities are that it's all, it's all an exercise the end of the day they're going to stay with with the UK they've been with them since 1703 there's no good reason to leave now and there's a lot of risk and trouble and expense to leave yeah it's probably sound and fury um, Scotland and even to a greater degree Wales which is in that uh, uh, sort of west central portion of uh, the British island um, they they feel they don't get no respect I remember humorously that when I was in Wales, and the name Border is uh, a Welsh name, so I have some ancestry <laughs> uh, back there. Now we know. <laughs> I, was, I was in the city of Harlech, this beautiful little town, and I was in a pub where um, I happened uh, not fortuitously to mention Bonnie Prince Charlie, who is the Prince of Wales after all, and uh, that resulted in getting some spit on my foot from one of the more lubricated <laughs> Uh, revelers in that pub. At least pub. you didn't get any fist in your mouth. That, I, was, I was lucky. Um, a, a cloth uh, wiped the spit off my shoe. But one thing's for sure, the Welsh people, just like the Scots, don't feel like, well, you know, Wales has three million population, so they feel like they don't get no respect. They're the Rodney Dangerfield of the British Empire. So um, the, the idea that uh, devolution or independence can be used as leverage is perhaps a, it may be a great uh, idea for a redistribution of power to more local areas and it, it's interesting because the debate about local versus national powers has been going on in the United States on and off certainly during the Reagan years 
uh, uh, local power was important, and now one might surmise that the national power seems to, the idea of the centralization of power carries more weight than it did 30 years ago. Well, you so, know, the thing about, we really haven't had the, the issue raised in terms of seceding from the Union uh, since uh, 1861. And, um, you know, I, I think for me, just from the vantage of an American citizen, uh, I'm just amazed that the UK would tolerate this for a minute. I mean, uh, you know, Washington did not tolerate the Civil War. The North did not to tolerate the secession of the South. Uh, no state has been, you know, gotten to first base with trying to secede. Uh, why, did, why did the UK tolerate this at all? Why did they allow a plebiscite? Why didn't they just say, no, we're not going to let you do that? Well, the civil unrest would increase. This, this has been a movement uh, that has been in place since the 70s, and Scotland had an earlier vote back in the 70s, and then there was some pressure to have another vote in the 90s. And when the vote happened at the earlier time, a plurality of people, not a majority of all Scots, but a plurality, voted yes. Uh, but since uh, the vote, as, as in every Western country, is not 100 percent, the non-voters uh, kept it to a plurality, and so that was taken as a no vote. Um, what happens here, I, I can't predict. I know that uh, the people who want to vote yes kind of feel like they're gaining in momentum, but with the Prime Minister of Great Britain up there now and with support from both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in Scotland, it would seem that there uh, is a considerable amount of vote for what they call Better Together, which is the movement to keep everybody together. So my prediction um, is probably not worth much more than the man on the streets, <laughs> well. but at least I've, I've entered the discussion and overall, I think it's an enormous opportunity for Scotland to have leverage. Scotland has 5 million people. Britain has 44 million people. So uh, Britain is the 800-pound gorilla. Yeah, but that's 10% of, of the whole country, though. Sure. Well, it's, it's enough to make a difference. And because the government has allowed for this plebiscite, this referendum, uh, it's possible that you could find yourself with an independent Scotland, but the Scots above all must recognize the difficulty of setting up a currency, yeah. an army, deciding whether to be in NATO or not. They have the leverage of having those sub bases, so that's a plus. You know the story, Pat, is the story is not so much in the result, but in the fact that they're having a plebiscite. And it seems to me the whole world would be interested in seeing that Scotland actually has a vote as to whether they secede. And in fact, if the vote, I guess this is the case, if the vote prevails and everybody says we want to secede, the UK will let them secede and they will in fact secede. So you, you ask yourself, what about the rest of the world? What about all these like countries that are associated with other countries? They've been folded in over, over the, you know, the hundreds of years of our recent past. Um, now they see what happens here, uh, or they see what could happen here and they say, gee, we should secede too. I mean, it relates to, for example, some of the states of this country. Uh, it relates to it relates to Hawaii. It relates to sovereignty right here. Sure. Uh, you know, this this could be a troubling event, not in the result, but in the fact of the vote. I'll tell you, I have to laugh because you're you're absolutely right. And during the few years that I lived during my college years in the state of Nebraska, uh, the panhandle portion of the state often wanted to secede and go uh, as a part of Wyoming and ironically the only thing that kept them in the fold was the fact that they were uh, so much in love with the Cornhusker football team. <laughs> That's what kept them together. Even though, they, even though they were in different time zones because <laughs> western Nebraska is in mountain time. So um, they're, worldwide um, the Czech Republic and Slovakia have exactly. separated but the Germanys have reunified, the Yemens have reunified, um, and so you have as much, uh, in, in some cases, people see the benefit of consolidation. And certainly, at least you can say this, with the fall of, the, uh, the, uh, of communism in Europe, that has tended to uh, put countries back together. And then, of course, my old favorite topic, the Koreas, whether or not they'll ever get together is a, a is a Gordian knot, uh, but they'll probably have some form of confederation ultimately. So uh, there are forces uh, pulling countries apart and making 
new countries. Um, Western Pakistan used to be, you know, in between, uh, on both sides of India, used to, have, used to have East Pakistan and West Pakistan, and then East Pakistan became Biafra, and now it's yet another country, um, and they have 160 million people there in, um, what's the name of the country that's over there um, on the other side that's flooding all the time? Um, the name slips in my mind, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a large country in population. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Pakistan lost population. You've got in, in um, you've got in, uh, you have uh, east and west um, in um, um, the um, republic nearby uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia. Um, well, two, doesn't this, you know, the show, the show we're talking about is getting it all together. And it strikes me that what you were talking, what you have been talking about over the last few months, North Korea, uh, and this discussion about, uh, you know, the possible secession of Scotland, devolution of Scotland, it, it all sort of, it all sort of circulates around one great big notion, and that is, you know, the, the, the borders are becoming more porous, uh, that the borders are dissolving, not devolving, but dissolving. Um, and so we are, we are becoming, we are getting it all together in a funny left-handed way. Um, and, the, you know, the world is going to be one. I mean, if not for any reason, then everybody likes the same football team. <laughs> really? And, and, of course, uh, the, the pressures seem to be everywhere. Uh, the, the point has been made uh, with the unrest in Iraq that that was an invented country and that it, it really does not have a single unifying concept to it, Shiite versus uh, Sunni, and uh, it was put together uh, by, by the British Empire after World War I, as was um, uh, some of the other countries. Uh, the Kingdom of Jordan is an artificial country. Uh, it's all part of uh, Pan-Arabia, I guess you could call it. We don't have a name for it now just because it's been so long uh, since uh, it was under the control of um, of Turkey. So well, Pat, I think the country you were trying to think of a little while ago was Bangladesh. Bangladesh, yeah. yeah. 160 million people, uh, formerly East Pakistan. So it's, it's uh, a large country uh, in population, and yet uh, it, it seems to have found its destiny away from Pakistan. And that's going to continue to happen, but somehow it doesn't seem like the right thing to happen in the British Isles. They, they lost India, they lost, um, we, within our lifetime, they lost Hong Kong, they lost Ireland in the early 20th century. So the sun definitely sets on the British Empire like never before. <laughs> but we, I, I, yes, I would have a hope that it would all stay together. And I, I really think that it, at, the, at the bottom of it, uh, with their Better Together program, the, the, that campaign by the British government and by uh, both parties in Scotland, that. Uh, the idea is uh, let's let's uh, reassess power sharing, uh, but let's stay together, and I think that's what will end up happening. But it's this is something because NATO is I mean we're the 800-pound gorilla in NATO, so if there's a shortfall um, for the lack of sub bases, how do we make up the difference with more aircraft carriers? Um, I, I don't know. Cost but plenty of money. It it I think that the the um, Independence of Scotland would cost U.S. taxpayers money galore. Well, the one thing I'm left with uh, in this discussion is that borders are not permanent. You know, and every time we think that they might be, uh, we, we find that history corrects us. Um, just as uh, some of the other areas you've talked about, borders change. People are putting, countries are putting pressure on borders. And if you look at the world closely today, you find that a lot of borders are under pressure. A lot of borders are moving while you watch. And that makes for great discussion here, and that's what we should focus on going going forward. Getting it all together with, with uh, Pat Border, the border man. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll tell you diplomat. what. I'll tell you what. Somehow we have to find a way to get back together again after this vote to see what happens next. Do the, do the Scots vote to remain with Britain? Uh, and if they don't vote to remain with Britain, does that mean necessarily that they would be an independent country, or is it just leverage to get a better deal from London? Thank you, Pat. I'm looking forward to the time we, we continue the conversation. See you in a couple months. Aloha. <laughs>